This lecture is about brain function. It has three goals, to introduce the types of cells in the nervous system and summarize how they signal to each other. It situates the brain within its evolutionary history to explain how brain systems produce behavior. And finally, discusses how drugs can affect brain function. Okay, so let's review some basic facts about neurons. So neurons are comprised of a soma or cell body. In the cell body is the nucleus that um, uh, where, where the, through genetic control the various proteins and other elements needed for nerve function are produced. These include the neurotransmitters that we'll um, describe later. Branching off of the cell body are dendrites that receive inputs from other neurons and uh, the, a given cell body can have many dendrites coming out of it, but each cell body has one axon, the output end, uh, coming out of it, and the axon can um, connect with other parts of the nervous system, with muscles, or with glands. Uh, the axons of some neurons are covered with a myelin sheath uh, that's produced by a type of glia known as oligodendrocytes. And this myelin sheath facilitates the transmission of the nerve impulse from the cell body to the end of the axon. Neurons are special because they're excitable. They're irritable. They generate and propagate nerve impulses. Uh, neuroscientists also refer to these nerve impulses as action potentials. These nerve impulses are brief. They occupy about one one thousandth of a second or one millisecond. They're an electrical event, and it propagates from the cell body to the axon terminals. The, the biophysics of this propagation are very well understood, and you don't need to worry about them. The conduction speed of about uh, 20 to 50 meters per second, depends on different kinds of neurons, um, is, is, it sounds fast, but it's measurably slow, um, and it results in variation on the order of the reaction time of humans uh, because of this slow conduction. As I said before, the speed of conduction of the nerve impulse is uh, uh, facilitated by the myelin sheath. The human brain, you'll read most textbooks will say there are a hundred billion neurons in the human brain. More recent counts put the number at around 85 or 86 billion. Uh, the typical neuron connects with anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 other neurons. These connections occur at a synapse. Each neuron, especially in the cerebral cortex, is also receiving input from thousands of other neurons. What that means is no single neuron influences any other neuron all that much. So for the brain to function, there has to be an organized collection of uh, uh, activation to result in perception and action and thought and so on. Now the connections between neurons occur at a specialized structure called a synapse. Um, neurons respond selectively to the inputs they receive. So there are complex biophysical processes in the dendrites that will say process the inputs. And we don't mean process like a computer but it's a nice metaphor to understand what's happening. The uh, dendritic tree of the neuron interprets the pattern of inputs, and um, how this interpretation happens is something that a lot of active research is, is working to understand. Uh, now, the pattern of connectivity in the brain is very um, specialized and complex, and we don't understand it entirely. Um, there's a new initiative uh, in the last few years to map the connections of the brain with ever more detail. But we need to appreciate even those connections change with uh, reactions to injury or experience. Um, as the brain develops, these patterns of connections are formed. Part of the development of the brain involves the production of excessive number of neurons and excessive connections between them and a process of pruning or killing off the connections and the neurons that aren't supporting useful uh, interpretations, let's say. So you're born with about all the neurons you're going to have. So neurons that fire together, wire together. 
Let me explain synaptic transmission. This is, a, this is a very superficial overview. Textbooks are written on this. You can find a great deal of more information, but this should give you enough of a background to interpret the um, information that will uh, be involved in the rest of this course. This is a diagram of the synapse. This is the axon, I mean the, the axon coming in to form a connection with the dendrite of another cell. The scale of this is at an electron microscope level. So this is beyond uh, uh, the ability to see under a light microscope. So the tip of the axon forms a specialized ending. It's comprised of subcellular structures called mitochondria that, that are the energy source for uh, cell processes. And synaptic transmission requires a lot of energy. Also in the end of the axon are structures known as vesicles. These round, uh, um, these are cross sections of bubbles. You can think of it as that. And these bubbles or vesicles are uh, containing the neurotransmitters that this particular neuron is going to release. The diagram illustrates the um, synaptic transmission event. So we imagine an action potential being issued from the cell body, traveling down the axon, and it reaches this tip of this branch of the axon. And when the action potential reaches the tip of the axon, it causes events to happen such that the vesicle moves to and binds to the membrane of the cell and becomes one with it and releases its contents into the synaptic cleft. So these small dots are intended to represent the neurotransmitter released into the synaptic cleft. And now it just floats around. And some of them will float in such a manner that they come into contact with the um, postsynaptic dendrite. And if they come into contact with the postsynaptic dendrite, they might come into contact with specialized molecular structures known as receptors. And if the neurotransmitter connects or binds to the receptor, it's something like a key in a lock. It's a useful metaphor to imagine. So only certain keys will work in certain locks. Likewise, only certain neurotransmitters work with certain receptors. If the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, then other things can happen, such as uh, making it more or less likely for the postsynaptic neuron to discharge an action potential to influence another neuron down the stream. Binding causes other processes that change the state of the neuron. Now let me introduce two other uh, specialized terms. The membrane of a, neuro, of a neuron is polarized. That means it's like a battery. If you measure the voltage across the membrane, we find that it has a small polarity, a small voltage. And that membrane then can become depolarized, going from more polarized to less, or it can become hyperpolarized, becoming even more polarized. If the membrane becomes more depolarized in the postsynaptic neuron, that increases the chance that that neuron will discharge an action potential. It will excite the neuron, we may say. If the neurotransmitter causes it to be hyperpolarized, this will decrease the chance that the postsynaptic neuron will uh, discharge an action potential. And so we can refer to that kind of neurotransmitter as inhibiting the postsynaptic neuron. Every neuron is receiving inputs that are both excitatory or depolarizing and inhibitory or hyperpolarizing. Once the neurotransmitter is in the synaptic cleft, it can't stay there forever or you wouldn't have the, the transient event of synaptic transmission. And so a variety of processes have evolved to remove the neurotransmitter from the synaptic cleft. I want to review those because we're going to learn that it's at these processes that many of the drugs that affect the brain operate. The first process that can remove neurotransmitters from the synaptic cleft is reuptake.
So there are receptors on the presynaptic axon that to which the neurotransmitter can bind and that creates a process that collects the neurotransmitter to recycle it. It took energy to make the neurotransmitter. If it's not broken, why not reuse it again? So these reuptake is one way to recycle the neurotransmitter molecule. Another basic method is to have other chemical processes that, that operate on the molecule and change its structure so that it's no longer effective as a neurotransmitter, to break it down. Finally, a third method is to uh, have glia, astrocytes, take up the neurotransmitter, consume it, and get it out of the synaptic cleft. Let me tell you a little bit more about glia. It supports and enhances neuron function. Glia comprise half the cells in the brain. We focus on the neurons because we think they're doing the processing, but more and more we're appreciating the complex role that glia play in not just the um, metabolism of the brain, but the, but the thought and processing. We understand that there are different kinds of glia. One produces the myelin sheath. I showed you that a moment ago. Uh, another type facilitates synaptic transmission by absorbing neurotransmitters and connecting neurons to blood vessels, communicating the metabolic need produced by the nerve impulses or the generation of nerve activity. Now, glia can be a site or the, one of the kinds of cells in which cancers develop. A glioma is a common and, and generally a lethal form of tumor that can occur in the brain. Uh, we referred in the last lecture to an astrocyte, a, a cyst in the um, um, arachnoid of the myelin. Glioma is another kind of damage to the brain through uh, glial cells. Okay, let's review then and, and get into a few more details about synaptic transmission. Um, we understand that there are three general types of neurons, excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, and what we'll call modulatory neurons. So excitatory neurons form a synapse on a cell, and the transmission at that synapse increases the probability that the postsynaptic neuron will produce a nerve impulse. Most commonly, excitatory neurons use a neurotransmitter known as glutamate. The glutamate neurotransmitter binds to a receptor and it causes depolarization, making the neuron less polarized, leading to the production of an action potential. Excitatory neurons can form connections nearby in the local vicinity of the cell body and the dendrites, but it can also form connections distantly. I told you in a previous lecture about the excitatory neuron in the top of your head in the cerebral cortex that innervates uh, the neurons in the middle of your back to make your toes flinch. The uh, neuron that sends its axon to your toe has to be as long as your leg, you see? Um, inhibitory neurons decrease the probability that the postsynaptic neuron will fire an action potential. The typical neurotransmitter goes by the name GABA. This refers to gamma amino butyric acid, better known as GABA. These neurotransmitters hyperpolarize the postsynaptic membrane, and usually inhibitory neurons only form connections locally within the dendritic field of neurons. Usually, not always. So, excitatory neurons make a neuron more likely to fire. Inhibitory neurons counteract that and make it less likely that they'll discharge an action potential or a nerve impulse. There's a collection of other types of neurons and neurotransmitters that modulate this excitatory inhibitory process. Excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons have a more immediate and transient influence. The modulatory neurons have a longer influence on the postsynaptic neuron and they tune the balance of excitation and inhibition. This is an effective way to think about them in general.
These modulatory neurons use a variety of neurotransmitters, some of them you will have heard about. Dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. These operate through what's known as a second messenger system, or second messenger mechanism. So glutamate and GABA bind to a receptor, and that receptor is generally connected to another molecule that allows uh, charged ions to flow through the nerve cell membrane, and that's how the neuron can become more or less polarized. Dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin don't connect to this ion channel. They connect to the, the receptor for dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, connect to another molecule in the membrane of the neuron, and that complex of um, uh, 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 membrane-bound proteins influence other processes inside the cell. And so there's an amplification and a prolongation of the effect of these second messenger neurotransmitters through this second messenger system. A great deal is known about this, uh, but, but if you just understand the basic concept of a second messenger, we're close enough to understanding what we need to uh, for this class. Now then, the cell bodies for dopamine cells, norepinephrine cells, and serotonin cells tend to be concentrated in the brainstem, in certain uh, uh, collections of cell bodies known as nuclei, and then the axons project all the way up to various stations in the uh, subcortical structures and all the way up into the cerebral cortex. So the very long axons and the very thin axons, so the nerve impulse, and they're not myelinated, so the nerve impulse in these can take a very long time to get up there, so they're a long, slow, modulatory effect. Now, to ground your knowledge a little bit more, let me say a word about dopamine. So one of the nuclei in the brainstem that has dopamine neurons is a part of the substantia nigra. I told you before that the substantia nigra is an integral part of the disease of Parkinson's disease. It is these dopamine neurons that are the ones that die resulting in the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And the drug L-DOPA, when consumed, goes into the brain and um, creates dopamine, which balances the uh, um, circuitry of the basal ganglia sufficient to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Here are some more details about synaptic transmission. So psychoactive drugs refer to the drugs that influence the state of the brain to influence the state of the mind. This can be thought or mood or memory, for example. And so drugs are categorized in two basic categories, agonists and antagonists. So agonists can operate presynaptically or postsynaptically, and antagonists can operate presynaptically or postsynaptically. So an example of dopamine function in Parkinson's disease is schizophrenia. So if I give you L-DOPA because you've got Parkinson's symptoms, your, 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 your movement disorder is treated just fine. But many patients begin to report psychotic episodes. They begin to have hallucinations and disordered thought, like schizophrenia. On the other side of the coin, schizophrenia can be treated, or at least some of the symptoms can be treated by drugs that block dopamine neurotransmission. So excessive dopamine results in some symptoms of, Parkin of, of uh, schizophrenia. Treating a schizophrenic with a drug that blocks dopamine transmission treats some of the symptoms, but after a while, the patient can begin to exhibit movement disorders like Parkinson's patients because these two systems are so uh, interwoven. Um, the drug Prozac operates at one of the reuptake uh, mechanisms for serotonin. There's a particular uh, 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 molecule, uh, protein molecule in the uh, presynaptic membrane known as a serotonin reuptake mechanism, and Prozac inhibits the reuptake of the serotonin. 
by blocking the reuptake, the Prozac keeps more serotonin in the synaptic cleft longer, allowing it to influence the postsynaptic neuron for a longer period of time. Now let me talk about the blood supply to the brain. This figure shows the distribution of um, arteries in red and veins in blue supplying uh, the cerebral cortex. You see the temporal lobe, the ventral aspect, the frontal lobe to the left, the occipital lobe to the right. And there's a dense collection of uh, blood vessels supplying all of this tissue. The uh, brain comprises one fortieth of the mass of the body, yet it consumes one fifth of all the oxygen. Nerve uh, processes are very metabolically costly. Uh, the human brain con uh, uh, contains 60,000 miles of blood vessels, large and small. Now, neuron function and blood flow are very closely related. There are certain uh, glial cells that connect uh, the, the blood vessels and the neurons to mediate the uh, consumption of oxygen and glucose as neurons uh, become more or less active. And that uh, connection between blood oxygen utilization and nerve function is the basis of uh, a brain imaging technique that we'll talk about in a subsequent lecture. Now then, there's another um, component of this that we want to talk about, the connection between the blood supply and the brain, and that's the blood-brain barrier. So the blood, the, the, I showed you earlier that the brain is protected physically from harm by the skin, the skull, the dura mater, the meninges. It's also protected from the chemical environment in the bloodstream by the blood-brain barrier, which is a, a functional and it has anatomical components too. Uh, uh, practically what this means is there are many substances that you consume that go into your bloodstream for other parts of your body that don't go into the brain, protecting the brain from harm. Some of these substances are the neurotransmitters used for uh, normal function. So, for example, a substance called dopamine, we'll learn, is a neurotransmitter uh, important for brain function. And it has to be, the amount of dopamine in the brain has to be closely regulated. So you get dopamine from eating certain foods, that's where it comes from, and if you had too much dopamine in your blood supply, that got into your brain, the balance in the system would not be correct. And so the evolution is uh, endowed us with a blood-brain barrier that prevents substances getting into the brain that would be harmful. As a result of this, uh, physicians have had to learn to be clever in situations where they need or want to get more of a substance like dopamine into the brain. And so in patients who have Parkinson's disease that I'll describe uh, more later, one of the treatments is a substance called L-DOPA. L-DOPA is the molecule that is turned into dopamine through the natural metabolic process. And so L-DOPA will transfer across the blood-brain barrier because in evolution we weren't experiencing any L-DOPA that wasn't what we got through nutrition.